Thank you, Pastor. Go ahead and be opening your Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis tonight. The book of Genesis, we're going to be in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. While you're turning in your Bible, you'll find as you look through the Word of God that certain people are introduced in different ways. We've talked about David at a great length today. First time you meet David, the first time uh, you, you, you find David, he's out watching his father's sheep. Even though Samuel has come into town and sanctified the entire Jesse family, David is still watching the sheep, still being a faithful and true servant to his father. The first time we meet Elijah the Tishbite, it's interesting that Elijah is introduced to us in one of the most unusual ways in Scripture. You're just reading along about the reign of King Ahab and then all of a sudden, the Bible just says, and Elijah the Tishbite. That's how he's introduced. There's no backstory. There's nothing. Just and Elijah the Tishbite, as if we should already know who Elijah the Tishbite is. But there are three men in the Word of God that are so earth-shaking, so earth-shattering, so history-making, who affected the entire world like no other three men that I know of in the history of the world, that they're introduced to us in the most unusual way in the Word of God. They're introduced to us at the end of a genealogy. For instance, the first one that's introduced that way to us is a man by the name of Noah. And the Bible traces the genealogy of man from Adam all the way up and concludes with the birth of this man by the name of Noah. In other words, it's not just important to know who Noah's father and great grandfather and great grandfather is. You're supposed to know who Noah's great 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 grandfather is. That's how important Noah is. And every person in the room, of course, is a descendant of Mr. Noah. Of course, the most obvious one, the most obvious earth changer, if you will, the person who had the greatest impact on the entire world is none other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we find two genealogies introduce him. One in the book of Matthew that begins with Abraham and goes all the way down uh, through our, Christ, our Savior's birth and concludes with, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. He's also given, we also have a second genealogy of our Savior in Luke chapter 3, which traces him all the way back to Adam. But there's a third man that uh, the Bible introduces to us in this unusual way, and his name is Abraham. In Genesis chapter 11, we find a genealogy that begins with Noah and comes all the way down and ends with the birth of this man by the name of Abram. And Abraham certainly changed the entire world. Uh, as, you, as you study the life of Abraham, you find out when we first meet him in Genesis chapter 12, he is actually more disobedient than he is obedient. God told him in Genesis chapter 12 to do three things. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. And when Abraham gets up to go, he takes his father's house with him and he takes his kindred with him. He disobeyed two of the three things that God had told him to do. We find as he goes down to Egypt, he, there's a famine in the land after they've built an altar there between Bethel and Hai and they've uh, worked worship the Lord after coming out of the earth of the Chaldeans. They then sojourn down into Egypt. And Abraham does something that as a husband, I find rather despicable early on in his life in the word of God. Abraham, when they go down to Egypt, remember Pharaoh could choose any woman he wanted for his harem. And apparently Sarah was very beautiful. And Abraham said to Sarah, when we get down there, make sure you tell everybody that you're my sister and not my wife. Now here's my problem with that. It didn't do anything to protect Sarah. The only person that protected was Abraham. And as a husband, I find that relatively despicable, don't you? Abraham should have been willing to be the sacrifice for Sarah, but that's not the way it was. He wanted her to lie to protect him. Abraham comes back. They come back to that same place where the altar was between Bethel and Hai there in chapter 13. And now Abraham is very rich in gold and silver. And Lot has been blessed with flocks and herds and tents. And so the two of them separate. And Lot continues to be a thorn in the flesh of Abraham for several more chapters of the word of God. You find Lot is, is captured and so Abraham mobilizes his servants and goes and rescues Lot and then conquers those kings that had taken him. And then God tells Abraham to give 10% of the spoil of what he took to this man by the name of Melchizedek, the priest of Salem. And Abraham graciously and willingly gives what the Lord's told him to give. 
Abraham had several conversations with the, word, with the Lord throughout the course of his life. As you read them, it depends on how you divide conversations and stuff like that in the word of God. But it looks like there are 17, before you get to Genesis chapter 22, 17 conversations that the Lord has with Abraham. And what is interesting about those 17 conversations, until you get to our text, is every conversation that God has ever had with Abraham either included a new promise or a reiteration of an old promise. In other words, God never had a conversation with Abraham that did not include a promise. And God's made him promises in basically four different areas of his life. He's made him promises about his person. He said, I will make thy name great. He said, I will be thy reward. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham has given, been given some promises about his person. He's been given some promises about his possessions. What did the Lord tell him? Every place that the sole of your foot touches will be yours. He said, all the land, all the way from the Nile River to the Euphrates is yours. All the land of the Canaan and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Perizzites. All of that land is yours. God has made Abraham promises about his person and about his possessions. He's also made Abraham promises about his protection. He said, I will bless him that blesseth thee and curse him that curseth thee. He said he's going to be Abraham's uh, shield over and over. God has promised Abraham his protection. So Abraham has had promises about his person, about his possessions, and about his protection. But the main area of promises from Almighty God to Abraham were about his progeny or his descendants. God has promised him that his seed would be like the sands of the sea and like the stars of the heavens. He's promised him that in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed, Abraham's descendants will affect the entire world all over it. And God has made all of those promises concerning a child that he was going to give to Abraham and Sarah. But Abraham and Sarah have gotten old and now they've decided that God can't do it anymore. And so Sarah gives her handmaid to Abraham and they conceive a child by the name of Ishmael. Now there was not one single promise about Ishmael that was made until Ishmael is kicked out of the house of Abraham. Ishmael is not the promised child that Abraham's going to have. And by the way, let me just take a moment and mention this. You will actually hear people today that will tell you that Abraham is the father of many religions. Abraham is not the father of any religion. He didn't start Christianity. He didn't start Bible believing. He didn't start theology. He did not start our, our religion, just to put it that way. And he did not start the Muslim religion. Abraham did not start any religions. He's the father of nations, not religions. Ishmael is the product. One promise, by the way, is made about Ishmael in the book of Genesis, that he would be a wild man, his descendants would be a wild man, and his hand would be against every man, and every man's hand would be against him. And we see that unfolding in our very, before our very eyes almost every single day in our world today. Ishmael was the product of lust. Isaac's going to be the product of love. Ishmael is a problem. Isaac is a promise. The simple fact is, God had made all of these promises through Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child. What's really interesting about that is when Abraham first hears that he, now he's in his 90s, that he and Sarah are going to have a child, Abraham's first response was exactly the same as Sarah's first response. Remember when Sarah heard it in Genesis chapter 18? The Bible says that she was listening at the tent door, and when she heard God say that he would return unto Sarah the time of life, and she shall have a child, the Bible says, and Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. Abraham, when he first hears that he and his aged wife, Sarah, are going to conceive and bear and raise a child, Abraham laughed as well. Do you know why that's so significant? Do you know what Isaac means in Hebrew? It means laughter. Do you know every time Abraham and Sarah held little baby laughter in their arms, they were reminded that God didn't need their help to fulfill his promises. They were reminded that God always delivers. They were reminded about how silly it was to ever doubt Almighty God, even for a second. Isaac has now grown up. 
Isaac, by the time you get to Genesis chapter 22, in all, with all the apologies necessary to the makers of every flannel graph and every Bible story book in the entire world, Isaac is not a little teenage boy in Genesis chapter 22. He's not a 10-year-old. He's about 25 years old by the time you get to Genesis chapter 22. Abraham is now old. Abraham, Isaac has grown up to be an adult now. It's now time for Isaac to have it all. It's time for Isaac to run the family. It's time for Isaac to take care of all the possessions that God has given them, all the wealth that God has provided. It's time for Abraham to sit on the front porch in a rocking chair and just enjoy retirement. God has called him to do things. He has done them, and God has blessed him. What, an, what a remarkable life that Abraham has had. It's time for him to ride off into the sunset, if you will. It's time for him to pass from the seed, scene and let Isaac take care of everything. But that's not the plan God had. In Genesis chapter 22, God is going to test Abraham in a manner like unto which I know of no other person that's ever been tempted. God is going to test Abraham in an unusual way. You'll hear lots of messages from this passage. You will not hear very many messages about this passage. You'll hear messages that will take the story that we'll read tonight, and preachers will preach about the similarities between Abraham and Almighty God, both of them willing to offer their son for a sacrifice. You will hear messages that will compare Isaac to Jesus Christ, the son being willing to be offered just because the father said so. And there's nothing wrong kinds of messages. Nothing wrong with that comparison. Nothing wrong with that analogy at all. It's perfectly fine, but the fact is that's not what this passage is about. This passage is not about Isaac being offered. It's about Abraham being offered. And as you get to this passage of Scripture, where we're going with the entire message is evident in the very words of the title. The title of the message is the same title as the song. Here it is. Is your all on the altar. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Begin reading with me and please in verse 1. And the Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. We'll come back to that word here in just a moment. And said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. Now watch this. Which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of the which, watch this, God had told him of. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and, and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto his father, to Abraham and his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Tonight I want to preach you this message, is your all on the altar. Let's have a word of prayer. The Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time together again in your house. Father, I pray that you'll bless tonight's message. Father, I know it is not the most comfortable message to listen to. Father, I realize that this test that you put Abraham through, that, Father, most of us, if not all of us, would fail from the very beginning. Certainly, I do not know that I've ever met anyone that would have gone three days' journey to offer up their son 
But Father, I pray that you'll help us as we look at this passage. We'll see this test. We'll see the similarities in our life in tests that we've received from you. Father, have your will in your way in everything that we say and we do. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice as we begin the message first, the call to sacrifice. Now, before we even get into it, in verse 1, the Bible says that God did tempt Abraham. And you will have some that want to pull a verse out and say that in the New Testament, God does not tempt any man. Read the passage in the New Testament. It is saying that God does not tempt any man to sin. Listen, if you're enticed to sin, that is not from Almighty God. It is Almighty God that controls the severity of your temptation. For God is faithful who also with the temptation also maketh a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. It tells us he'll not suffer us to be tempted above that which we're able. In other words, God controls the temptations that come into our life to make sure that there's never going to be a temptation that any Christian could ever stand up and say, it was just too much for me. That is an untrue statement and will always be an untrue statement. In the, in the Old Testament, in this passage, it's not talking when the word tempt is used, it's not talking about tempting someone to sin. It's talking about tempting or testing or trying one's faith. And God certainly is going to try the faith of Abraham in this passage of Scripture. But if you are God, excuse me for putting it that way, but if you were God... How would you go about testing Abraham? Get out of your house and go? Yeah, he did that one. Fight and, and deliver, uh, deliver Lot? No, he did that one. When you get finished with that, give a sacrificial offering to Melchizedek? No, he did that one. If you're going to test Abraham, it's going to have to be more than just about his family, about his fortune, and about his fighting, because Abraham's already passed those three tests. If you're going to test this man, Abraham, who's walked with the Lord now for well over a quarter of a century, you're going to have to, excuse me, come up with a doozy, aren't you? Abraham is going to be tempted like into which I have never been tempted. And excuse me, you've never been tempted this way either. God is going to test Abraham in such a way that it ought to make our knees go weak when we read about it. Notice the call to sacrifice first. I want you to notice the demand. God says to Abraham, take now thy son. It's interesting. This son, Isaac, is the son that God had promised in Genesis chapter 12. The son that God had personified in Genesis chapter 17. And the son that God provided in Genesis chapter 21. This is the son that Abraham and Sarah have been looking forward to having. But I want you to notice something. They could not look. When they held little baby laughter in their arms, Abraham and Sarah could not say, Boy, I am so glad that Dr. So-and-so was our OBGYN or we'd have never had Isaac. Isaac. No, no, they couldn't give the credit for the birth of Isaac to a doctor. They could not say, boy, I sure am glad that medical science finally came up with a way for a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman to conceive and bear and deliver a child. I sure am glad science has come so far. No, they could not give the credit for Isaac to doctors or to, or to science or to anybody else. As they held Isaac in their arms, they had to be sure, they had to be positive that Isaac was a gift directly from Almighty God. And God is now asking Abraham to give back what God has given Abraham. Can I tell you something, Christian? That's all God has ever asked anyone to do. The only thing he ever asks of you or from, from me is what he has already given us. Oh, no, Brother Harper, I earned this. I'm the breadwinner. No, you're not the breadwinner. God's the bread provider. Remember what Jesus taught us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Everything that you and I have, everything that we hold dear, everything that we would say belongs to me, was given to us by Almighty God. And there's nothing that you have that you got without his aid. He asked Abraham for something that God has provided. He also asked Abraham for something that is personal. See, God knows this about us. That once he gives us something, once he gives us a family, once he gives us financial blessings, once he gives us a home, once he gives us something, we as human beings take ownership. It does not seem in this passage of scripture that God has any kind of problem with us taking ownership of what he has given us. That's exactly how he words it. Take now thy son. He does not say, Abraham, that boy I just gave you, give him back to me. Would God have not been justified in saying so? Of course he would have. But he knew that from the very moment of Isaac's birth, that every time Abraham and Sarah looked at him, they said, he's, 
my son. He asks us for something that is personal, doesn't he? Not just something that he's provided, but something that he's personal. We mentioned it briefly from a different angle, but everything changes when it becomes personal, doesn't it? When it becomes yours, it changes everything. Let me give you an illustration. Several years ago, we were going to uh, for, uh, Kashmir Baptist Church in Kashmir, West Virginia. It's spelled Kashmir, but if you say Kashmir, they'll know you're an outsider. So it's Kashmir Baptist Church. We were going up there and you may not know this about me. I know I've been here several times. I may have told some of you, but I personally hate rain. I just hate it. I don't like rain at all. No other type of weather. I mean, you, you look out the window and you see snow falling. What do you say? Oh, it's snowing. You look out and see a with no clouds. You say, oh, it's not a cloud in the sky. You might say, oh, look at the big, beautiful, white, fluffy clouds. But you open those curtains and you look outside and you see rain coming down. What do you say? It's raining. <laughs> That's exactly so, Brother Harper. God gave us rain. Yes, why? Think about that for just a second. The only weather pattern that God has ever used to punish the entire earth is rain. And the Bible tells us he calls it to rain on the just and the unjust. So the truth of the matter is, whether you're wicked or whether you're righteous, it's going to rain on you and you're going to be miserable. I hate rain. I despise rain. I tell my wife all the time, I'd rather bleed out of my eyes than walk in the rain. I just don't like it. We got to Cashmere Baptist Church. I started to unhook my trailer. And just as I did, the rain came down. Now, my father-in-law, if you've ever been to West Virginia, those of you that have some background there, they do not use the word wash. My father-in-law has never used a wash rag in his life. He's used a wash rag. They wash. And it became, it came down, as he would say, a gully washer is what it did. It was pouring down. Here I am trying to get my trailer hooked up, putting slide outs out, hooking up in a, a downpour, 50 amp, 220 electric to my trailer, all this kind of stuff. I am soaked. My hands are pruny. I am absolutely, positively as miserable as I can be. I hate being outside in the rain. I came in. I slammed the trailer door. My wife dutifully went to the other side of the trailer to stay away from me because I'm miserable when I've been outside in the rain. The next, by, by the way, my dog hates rain as much as I do. You wake up in the morning, you know how your dog wants to go outside. If I open up the door and it's raining, he'll just go inside. See you later. And walks back in and sits back down. I was walking one time in Florida. We're walking along. It starts raining and he's not even trying to go back to the room. We're staying in a hotel and he's not even trying to go back to the room. I tried to figure out why my dog is so comfortable walking in the rain. Then I realized he's walking under an awning and I'm not. Smarter than I was. I went to church the next morning there in Kashmir, and every single person, I mean, without exception, shook my hand and said, Oh, Brother Harper, wasn't that rain a blessing? No. <laughs> It was not. I finally told one fella, I said, no, I don't like rain at all. You know what he told me? He said, oh, we needed it. He said, I was about to lose all my crops until we got that rain. Changes everything when it becomes personal, doesn't it? He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Then he says something else. There's, there's a thing. When you go to Bible college, you take some classes. Now, the classes, just like if you're going to go and, and, and be a doctor, all right. You're, you don't call your doctor a kidney doctor. All right. He might work on your kidney, but he's actually known as a nephrologist, which sounds more impressive. The kidney doctor or the nephrologist. It just sounds better, doesn't it? It's much more impressive. You know, you know, Bible colleges do the exact same thing. When you go to Bible college, you don't take a class that says teaching you how to preach. You take a class called homiletics. That sounds so much more impressive. You should all be sitting there impressed because I took homiletics. I know a whole bunch of guys that took homiletics didn't learn how to preach, though. That's just. <laughs> but then there's another class with an even more, more impressive sounding name. There's a class called hermeneutics. Now, seriously, you have to be impressed just with the title, hermeneutics. What it is is how to study your Bible. It's what it basically is. And when you take hermeneutics, they'll teach you something called the first mention principle. And this is important. In the first mention principle, what it basically says is the first time something occurs in the Bible that repeats throughout the Word of God, the circumstances around that first mention basically apply through the rest of the Word of God. For instance... <laughs> 
Uh, when the first time blood is shed in the, in the entire Bible, the first time an animal is sacrificed, God kills an animal to cover up the nakedness of Adam and Eve in the garden and makes them coats of skins. So the very first blood sacrifice ever offered in the Word of God was offered to cover up the sin of mankind. And of course, you see that all the way through the Old Testament as the nation of Israel, every time they offer up a sacrifice, almost all things were by the law, purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. All the way up until the last sacrifice that is offered, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down and at the right hand of God. Up until the Lamb of God is offered, every sacrifice by God's people throughout the Word of God is designed to cover up the sin of mankind. The first mention of that goes all the way with it through the rest of the Bible. There are two first mentions in Genesis chapter 22, by the way. Two, not just one. The first one, this isn't part of the message, this is just extra. The first first the, the, uh, so the one first mention that's in this passage of Scripture is the first time the word worship is ever used in the Word of God. Abraham says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Let me ask you, was Abraham planning to go up on that hill and have a singspiration with Isaac? No. Abraham, as far as he knew, was going up on that hill to offer up a sacrificial offering to Almighty God. Worship is not tied to singing from its first mention. It's tied to sacrifice. You'll do more worshiping when you put your faith promise and your missions offering into the offering plate than you'll ever do just singing what they call a praise and worship chorus. Worship has the connotation of sacrifice, not the connotation of singing. Notice carefully, though, there's a second first mention. Did you know the first time love is mentioned in the Word of God? It's not that Abraham, that God looked at, at Adam and Eve after they'd been kicked out of the garden and still loved them. Nope. It's not that Noah's up on top of the mountain and the waters are receding and God, uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and the Lord loved him. No. The first mention of love in the Word of God actually has nothing to do with God. The first mention of love in the Word of God is parental love. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Here's why that whole first mention thing is so important. If love is tied to parental love throughout the Word of God, and it is, then that means that every single time that God describes us as his children, describes himself as our father, you know what he's really saying? I love you. Let that sink in for just a second. When it says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Do you know what he's actually saying there, Christian? He said, I love you. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, them gave you power to become the sons of God. Even them believe on his name. You know what he's really saying there? <laughs> I love you. The first mention of love in the word of God is right here. As, as Abraham hears the words from God, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. God, certainly everything he's ever asked us for is something that he's provided. Many times once he provides something, we claim it as our own and we say, no, it's personal. And then when God says, no, I still want it. I still want you to surrender it. I still want you to sacrifice it. I still want you to give it. How many times have we looked at Almighty God and said, no, you can't have this. I love it. By the way, let me point this out as well. God isn't, and this will sound strange when I say it, God isn't just asking Abraham for Isaac. So Brother Harper, isn't that enough? No. I, I am afraid it's not. God is literally asking Abraham for everything. Does it matter if Abraham has all the land the which, the which the sole of his foot has touched over the last 25 years, if there is no Isaac to give it to? 
If he has no descendants to pass it on to, all the promises about the whole family, the earth being blessed, that goes away if there is no Isaac. Seed as the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven, oh, that promise is gone if there is no Isaac. God being the reward of Abraham, when it's this same God that takes away his son Isaac that he loves, that promise is gone. Every promise that God has made to Abraham in one way or another collapses once Isaac is offered on that mountain. Say, Brother Harper, but that's not everything. He still has Sarah. And Sarah is, in Scripture, a wonderful woman. She's an, an iconic woman in the Word of God. <laughs> but let me ask you this. If Abraham and Isaac get up in the morning, and they leave, and six days later they come home, and Sarah sees Abraham and two servants riding up, and she comes out to meet them, Ladies, let me ask just the ladies for just a minute. You think about this for a second. And she says, honey, where's Isaac? And Abraham swallows hard and says, well, well, sweetheart, I murdered Isaac. What would Sarah's first question have been? Oh, yes, she calls Abraham Lord, but don't you think she'd have said, why? Could you imagine what would have gone through her mind when Abraham looks at her and says, because God told me to. And then Sarah would say what every mother would say. She would say, can I at least see him? And Abraham would say, no, honey, I burn him. Abraham isn't just, suppo just supposed to offer Isaac. He's supposed to offer Isaac for a burnt offering. Can you imagine what it would have done to Sarah if Abraham stood there and said, Honey, the only thing left of your 20-something-year-old son, the only thing left of that child that we prayed for for a quarter of a century, the only thing left of that miracle baby that God gave us are some ashes three days from here? Let me ask you a question, every lady in the room, please. How long do you think Sarah would have lived after that? How long do you think she could have trusted Abraham after that. God hasn't just asked Abraham for Isaac. He's asked Abraham for every single thing he has. He's asked Abraham to give back every single promise that God has ever made him. And I'm here to tell you something, Christian. That's a scary thing. Notice there's the demand. The call to sacrifice, we saw the demand was something personal, something that was provided and something about which he was passionate. But then there's the duration. I believe that when the Lord says, Abraham, I want you to get up tomorrow morning and go and offer Isaac three days journey. I'll tell you where you're going once you get on the road. Once you get there, I'll tell you which mountain. Just go to the area of Moriah. I'll tell you which mountain once you get there. I don't think Abraham, remember, let me put this, let me say this quickly. Abraham's just a human being, ladies and gentlemen. There's no celestial blood flowing through his veins. He's just a man like me and you. I don't think Abraham said, okay, I'm going to bed now. Do you? Would you have been able to just roll over and go to sleep? <laughs> I think there's a conversation that goes on outside of the confines of Scripture. At the end of verse 2, God says, I want you to go to one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. The next morning, Abraham is on his way to the place that God had told him of. Even when they get up on top of the mountain, it's the place that God had told him of. I personally believe there's a sleepless night in here somewhere. Abraham tossing and turning and talking to Almighty God. I believe the conversation between Abraham and Almighty God went on all evening long. By the time Abraham wakes up in the morning, he has more information than he had when God first spoke to him the night before. But not just a sleepless night. I, there's a silent journey. Let me say this. Abraham got up the next morning and he packed. Would you have packed? I don't know that I'd have packed. I don't know if I were Abraham, if I wouldn't have just said, you know, Lord, I've passed lots of tests that you've given me. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Lord, I'm just going to have to fail this one. Wouldn't that have crossed your mind? Lord, this is just too great a sacrifice. I can't do it. I'm going to stay right here. But Abraham got up and packed. I might have packed like Jonah and headed in the opposite direction. 
But Abraham just packed up and started going. Can you imagine every step of the way? Getting further from Sarah and closer to the mountain where he's going to offer Isaac as a burnt offering? Can you imagine? There's no rainbow in the sky. There's no manna falling from heaven. The birds aren't whistling the hallelujah chorus. There's no quail falling. There's no water coming out of a rock. There's no attaboys from Almighty God. There isn't the Lord whispering in his ear with every step. Way to go, Abraham. Way to go, Abraham. Way to go, Abraham. No, there's nothing. Just silence from heaven. No compliments. No encouragement. No miracles. No signs. Nothing. Imagine Abraham fitfully trying to sleep that first night. Getting up the next morning and continuing on. Let's just be as honest as we can tonight, Christian. Whether you would, you would have packed, whether you would have started or not, makes no difference at all. None of us would have gotten up the second morning and kept walking. He just kept going. No encouragement from heaven. No prophet standing there preaching how wonderful a job Abraham is doing. No certificate saying, walk the furthest on the first day from the pastor of the church. Nothing. Can you imagine waking up that third day? A day's journey in the Bible is seven miles. In Bible lands, you can easily see the mountains off in the distance. Every step Abraham takes that third day brings him closer to the mountain. Brings it more into visibility. Every step he sees the place where he's going to offer his son as an offering. There's the silent night, the sleepless night, I'm sorry. There's the silent journey. Then there's the steep climb. <laughs> they get to the bottom of the mountain and I've heard preachers preach verse 5 as if it's some great statement of faith by Abraham. It's just not. I'm sorry to disagree. Abraham says to his servants, uh, to the young men that were with him, Abide you here at the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And they'll make it sound like Abraham is making some great statement of faith that he knows that Isaac is going to come down. No, Abraham had faith that God could raise Isaac from the dead. He didn't know what God was going to do next. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 17 through 19 says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You know what that means? Abraham knew that God could. He didn't know that God would. That's the difference, isn't it? I mean, God could have taken away Paul's thorn in the flesh. But he didn't. The simple fact is, as you look at this, this is not a statement of grand faith. This is an old man getting ready to walk up a hill with his 25-year-old son and two servants. What did you expect Abraham to say to him? Hey, guys, Isaac and I are going up in this mountain. I'm going to cut his throat, and then I'll be down in a little while. If you were Abraham's servants, what would you have done if Abraham said that? You'd have tried to talk him out of it, wouldn't you? Let me ask you this. If you were Abraham, how easy would it have been to talk you out of it? What'd you expect Abraham to say? He doesn't know that Isaac's not going to run. I mean, Abraham's obviously a pretty tough guy at his age, but if I had to pick who's going to win this race, I think Isaac could have outrun Abraham. I don't see Abraham running up behind Isaac and tackling him and tying his legs together like a rodeo uh, rider in a, in a calf. It's just not going to happen. Abraham doesn't know how anybody's going to respond. He's not told Sarah what he's going to do. He's not telling his young men what he's going to do. And he's not even telling Isaac what he's going to do. And they start walking up that mountain together, just the two of them. And then that moment that you know that Abraham has been dreading for three solid days. The moment when he's finally asked. And Isaac says, Dad. He said, Father. He said, here am I, my son. And Isaac said, behold, I see the, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And by the way, if you preach this message to a bunch of preachers or at a camp meeting or a tent revival, if you preach what happens in the next verse, 
you'll get people waving hankies and running up and down the aisles and having a great time. They almost preach verse 8 as if, as if Abraham is prophesying. Notice what Abraham says in verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Some preachers will say that Abraham is telling Isaac that God has provided a lamb on top of that mountain and God's taking care of it. That's not true. God does, does not, in this passage of Scripture, provide a single lamb at any time. He provides a ram, doesn't he? So if Abraham is prophesying what's going to happen on top of that mountain, then he's wrong. But then you'll hear have preachers preach it like this. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. That's good preaching, isn't it? It'll get people shouting. Then they'll take you to John chapter 1 and verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And you'll hear that God himself provided himself a lamb. The only problem with that is the rest of the verse. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Jesus was not a burnt offering. Jesus was the Passover lamb. There is a significant difference. And if Abraham is prophesying the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, here in verse 8, he is absolutely wrong. And the Bible tells us that the way to tell if someone is a false prophet is whether they're wrong or not when they say they're speaking for the Lord. Abraham, if he is prophesying here, has just proven to us that he's a false prophet. Abraham is not prophesying here. Abraham is saying the only thing he can think of to his son. What would you have said? Oh, Isaac, didn't I mention this? You're the sacrifice. Would you have said that? You don't know what Isaac's going to do. You don't know how he's going to respond. Notice carefully, please, that steep climb. Can you imagine Abraham and Isaac walking up side by side? Abraham, the only one knowing what's going to happen on top of this mountain. Notice, number one, there's the call to sacrifice. We saw the demand and the duration. Number two, there's the complete surrender. <laughs> they fix the altar together. And then he lays Isaac on the altar. I heard a preacher preach one time. Oh, it was, it was a very good message. It really was. I'll never forget it. But the whole message was basically this. That as, as Abraham is going up the mountain, the ram's going up the other side. The same preacher, though, actually said this. He said, what a blessing it must have been for Abraham that Isaac willingly surrendered. Can I tell you something, Brother Monteith? I don't think that would have made it easier. Don't you think it would have made it harder? Abraham and Isaac are there. The altar is finished. There's still no lamb. Isaac has to be wondering. He's not just some little child. He's a grown man. He's got to be looking around wondering what dad's going to do next. And dad sits down and Isaac sits down. And Abraham says, son, I didn't want to tell you now. But we came up here so I could offer you as a sacrifice. And Isaac would have had to ask, wouldn't you? Dad, why? And Abraham would have looked him in the eye and say, son, God told me to do it. Abraham, and you, Isaac, like me and you, probably would have said, are you sure? <laughs> and then Abraham said, yes, son. I'm sure this is what God wants. Can you imagine that moment when Isaac looked at his father and said, well, Dad, you better go ahead and tie me up. I'd hate to struggle. I don't think that would make it easier. I think if you're Abraham, you're standing there thinking, what a son. What a boy God gave me. Look how he's grown up, willing to trust the Lord, willing to trust his dad. Now Abraham has to offer that young man on that altar. Isaac just completely surrenders. And again, the picture of him and our Savior. Our Savior saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There's nothing wrong with preaching the picture. Then Abraham lifts up the knife. He stretches out his hand and takes the knife, by the way. All the, again, I, I hate to criticize Bible story books, but they all picture Abraham with his hand way in the air like this. That's just not how it happens. The sacrifice was offered by a quick slice across the juggler. 
Abraham would have had that knife right here at Isaac's throat. Notice, number one, there was the call to sacrifice. Number two, there was the complete surrender. But number three, there's the comprehensive solution. There are no extra words in the Word of God. We understand that. There are no words that are just thrown in there so it sounds better. But I do think there is an extra word in this passage of Scripture. As Abraham places the knife and his son's juggler, all of a sudden he hears, Abraham! Abraham! Personally, I don't think he needed to say it twice. I think it probably went, hey, yes, sir. <laughs> I don't think Abraham waited for the second time just to make sure God got the right name. The offering was prompt. Five minutes earlier, and you and I would never know whether Abraham was willing to go through with it or not. One minute later, Isaac would have been dead. Then it would have been up to Almighty God what happens next. The simple fact is, the offering, the, 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 the offering that's going to be offered was offered at the exact right time. God is never late. He's always on time. I remember when we were kids, my dad was, um, I, I was, I think, eight, eight or nine. My sister was six or seven. My dad was having family devotions with us, and he was reading from John chapter 11. And as he was reading the story of Lazarus, and Jesus comes, and Lazarus has been dead four days, and then Jesus tells them to roll the stone away. And I think it was Martha that said, but Lord, he's been dead four days. He stinketh. I thought that was the funniest thing in all the history of mankind. I started laughing and giggling. My sister started laughing and giggling. And, and for the next 10 minutes, we could not stop. Every time dad would start trying to read some more, one of us would go, he stinketh. And we would just start laughing. It's, it's still, when you really think about it, it's still one of the funniest things in the Word of God. The funniest thing in the Word of God to me is the story of Sceva. You ever read the story of Sceva? It is an amazing story because of the sarcasm in it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big sarcastic fellow in case you didn't know. This man, Sceva, sees Paul casting out demons. And so he decides with his seven sons that he's going to cast out a demon. So he goes to a house where a man is demon-possessed. And he walks in, and just like he saw Paul do it, he stands up and he says, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. And I love, it's, it's kind of funny to say that I love what the demon says next. But I love what the demon says next. He says, Jesus I know. Paul I know but who are you <laughs> and then the demon jumps on Sceva and his seven sons beats them up strips them naked and kicks them out, out into the street can you imagine Sceva trying to explain what had just happened to me that's just the funniest story in all the word of God was when the demon says well who are you but anyway but as, as a kid I've digressed but as a kid when they when they tell this when, when, when they said he stinketh it's amazing that Martha thinks that Jesus is late but he's not late. He's never late. The exact moment when Abraham was completely committed and willing to offer his son, and there was absolutely no question for me or for anybody else or even for Almighty God that Abraham was willing to go through with it. You want to know something amazing, though? <laughs> that because of this moment, Romans says that Abraham is called the friend of God. What a title! We still to this day, we sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And God sings, what a friend I have in Abraham. Think about that for just a second. He's called the friend of God. The offering was prompt. Not only was the offering prompt, the offering was provided. <laughs> Again, that, that whole message about uh, the ram coming up one side while Abraham and Isaac are going up the other side, it made for a great message. But personally, I believe that the ram has been there for three days. I believe that God had already provided that ram before Abraham even packed up and started heading to, toward Moriah. If we're going to keep the picture from Scripture intact, then that ram had to have already been there, didn't he? Because our Savior was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Even before the sin took place, he was already in God's mind, the lamb slain. Even before Abraham packed up and left with Isaac, the ram was already there. 
The offering was prompt. The offering was provided. I love this. The offering was perfect. Again, there are no extra words, but if you take three words out of this text of Scripture, once again, the whole picture falls apart. It's a ram caught in a thicket. If the next words were by his thigh, if the next words were by his neck, if the next words were by his leg, then he would have been a scratched and marred sacrifice and would not have been acceptable. There's only one way that that ram could be caught in a thicket and still be a suitable sacrifice. Only one way that he could be caught in a thicket and not be marred and not be scratched and still be without spot and without blemish. And that's if he's caught by his horns. Because God never has settled for anything that wasn't without spot and without blemish. That's why you can't pay for your own sins. Because you're a sinner. Only a perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God could sacrifice himself for your sins and for mine. The offering was prompt. The offering was provided. The offering was perfect. And then lastly, the offering was presented. Abraham goes and gets the ram and offers him in the stead of his son. Here's what I want you to see and we'll be done. This passage of scripture, this test, was never a test for Isaac. Although Isaac would have passed. It is God is going to tempt Abraham. God is not here in this passage of scripture testing the loyalty of Isaac. He's testing Abraham. It is not Isaac that is going to be offered on this altar. It is Abraham that is going to be offered on this altar. And what God asked me and you for is exactly what he asked Abraham for. See, Brother Harper, wait a minute. You just said none of us have been tested that way. No, but we've been asked for the same things. We've been asked for the exact same things that Abraham has been asked for. We've been asked by Almighty God to give up that which we love. We've been asked by Almighty God to give up that which is personal. And we've been asked by Almighty God to give up that which he has provided. The difference is Abraham was willing to go through with it. And most of us are not. Most of us do not surrender because we don't trust God. And you read a passage like this and you say, wow, look how the Lord tested Abraham. Let me remind you of something, please. When Abraham walked down out of that mountain, he walked down with Isaac. God asked, get this statement, please. God asked Abraham for everything. But he took nothing. Did you get that? Abraham gave nothing on top of that altar except a ram that God had provided. Abraham walked down out of that mountain just as whole as he was when he went up it. In other words, it is not God's desire to take you and leave you penniless and homeless because he took everything from you. It is God's desire that we are willing to put it all on that altar. God was interested in Abraham here, not Isaac. And Abraham passes this test in such a remarkable way. But I will remind you, Christian, that God just wants us to be willing to give it. What kind of God would he be? If he asked us for everything, took it away from us, and then discarded us. That's not the God we serve, is it? He would certainly be justified if he did. He certainly would not have to explain himself to me or to you. But the simple fact is, he asked Abraham for everything. And he took nothing. How many people do you know that have come to an altar finally after struggling for years about surrendering their life to the Lord, finally came to an altar and gave the Lord everything and the next day they did exactly what they did the day before. I could take you to the home of a businessman in Tennessee, had a whole lot of money, owned two different large companies, had hundreds and hundreds of employees and he struggled because as the rich young ruler he had much possessions. But finally, on one Thursday night, he got out of his seat. He came to the altar. He said, Lord, you can have it all. 
every dollar I've ever made, every idea I've ever had, everything that I own, every member of my family, they're all yours. You know what he did the next day? He went back to his job just like he'd done the day before. But this time he knew he was willing to give it all to the Lord. So what I'm saying is, Christian, God expects us to be willing. And God is only going to take that which will make us walk closer to him. Delight thyself also in the Lord. It does not say, and he will take away everything that you've ever had. It says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Surrendering everything to God. Let me put this this way and I'll be done. You have never gotten the short end of the deal when you gave something to God. It just doesn't work that way. And I'll say it one more time. God asked Abraham for everything. And then God took nothing. So let me ask you, Christian. Is your all on the altar? He doesn't ask us to sacrifice our children. He asks us to be willing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? No one looking around.